This person I'm about to introduce, and I'll have her introduce her husband, who's just a, really a terrific, terrific guy, is a friendship that actually started on Facebook. Um, she posts these wonderful photographs of San Francisco Bay, sunrises and moonrises. I know a lot about photography. I was intrigued. What kind of camera, what kind of a lens? I know the answer, a Canon, a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter lens. So you can send those little private messages. And I asked her if she would call me, <clears throat> which she did. And uh, we talked for 45 minutes. And out of that came this invitation. And she's such a terrific person that she agreed to come. The, uh, the book that she wrote, <clears throat> The Female Brain, has sold over a million copies. If you realize <clears throat> that most books published barely sell two or 3,000 copies, one million is an overwhelming number. And um, the book itself, which was to have been here, except that United Parcel Service seemed to have had some problems, um, and I apologize. No, actually, they need to apologize. It's not my fault. But I'm sorry about that. We'll try to work it out in some other way. But she agreed to come. Um, um, she's just terrific. A local kid who made good. We love those kinds of stories. Welcome, please, the one and only Dr. Luann Brosadine. can never say no to George, right? <laughs> I can see you guys in the room. You're part, part, of, the, part of the George Club <laughs> at any rate. Um, it's nice to be here because I went to Oceanside High School. And it's funny, yay, go Pirates, right? <laughs> and um, one of my classmates, as it turns out, shows up this morning that I haven't seen in 45 years. Hi, Peter. You know you're more handsome now than you were then. <laughs> And I just found out in talking with him today, his first kiss was with one of my girlfriends <laughs> that I hadn't seen in 45 years till last week we got together for lunch in Berkeley. She happens to be vice president of Clorox. So at any rate, local kids done good. Our high school was actually number two from the bottom of the list. Very different than this place. <laughs> at any rate, Peter, that was great. And I was thinking also, um, you know, thinking because Jonathan is here, and my favorite teacher was Mr. Clavier. Do you remember him? He was history teacher, and um, I think I just learned more about politics and world history and the, the world there from Mr. Clavier than anything. And we had a few great biology teachers as well. So they had a program in those days in California where you could leave high school after three years if you took. I think it was civics or something at the local junior college. So I did Miracosta Junior College for something trig and then that at the same time and went to, on to UC Berkeley because I was, I was really anxious to get out of, out of the house. I'm the oldest daughter in a preacher's family. So my father was the minister of the first Christian church in Oceanside. And somehow in your teen years, <laughs> you were interested in getting, getting out of the house and, and started making your own life. So I was lucky enough to get into um, UC Berkeley. I think in these days I probably get, wouldn't be able to get in, but at any rate, I wanted to go and study. I went to the architecture, the environmental design school. I applied to that school, which is a school within UC Berkeley, because I wanted to design environments for people that would help them be their best, maximize their creativity. I, you know, I had this idea at 17 or 18 that I, I wanted to, the people's environments really had a lot to do with who they could be. And of course, you know, growing up in a liberal family and th thinking that really we, we all have the same, if we have the right opportunities that anybody could do it. So I did architecture there uh, for, a, for the first year, year and a half at Cal Berkeley before the days of AutoCAD, and, and so you had to draw everything with rapidographs and ink drawings and all this detailed stuff, and I, that's not what I went. I went to do something that was building an environment for people, so it wasn't, wasn't sort of psychological enough for me, and I took a, a left turn to the other side of the campus to a brand new major that was the first in the country at the undergraduate level called neurobiology. And I was really interested in, in behavior and how, I was so cool that 
you know, I want to understand what causes our behavior. And I didn't know I was studying with a lot of the greats who were forging the field in hormones and behavior. A guy named Frank Beach was working out how all of the sex hormones caused our interest in sex. And if you didn't have it, you didn't have it. You know, so of course, at 18 or 19, that's what you're mostly interested in anyway. Yeah. So, right? <laughs> so I think that, you know, how they say that, uh, the personal is political and the political is always personal. It, it, that your, your life is sort of what stage of your life you're at has to do with what your interests are. So I did neurobiology and learning how the brain functions and studied with a lot of the people doing hormones and behavior there and decided that you could either go the PhD route in the lab or you could go an M, the MD route into medical school, kind of that was the, and I decided that I would like to make a living <laughs> since I was growing up in the era when my mother said, who was a, actually a kindergarten teacher at South Ocean Side Elementary for 35 years, so just up at the road here, um, that you know, women needed to be able to support themselves and kind of be, be independent. So I took the route for several reasons to being an MD, and um, I went to Yale Medical School, and it was the first class in 76 uh, when, when women were admitted to Yale. And because I was in medical school, they'd had some women there before, but on the other campus, they'd all been male until that year, which of course was kind of a real culture shock, because I've been at UC Berkeley. I've been working for the women, Women's Her Story Library. I, you know, it was, you're, you just grow up when you're 18, 19, and you just you take things for granted. So I went to New Haven, Connecticut, to Yale, and uh, went to medical school there and found that it was um, very much sort of behind in the area that I was interested in, which was like hormones and behavior, but I needed to learn all about the body and the brain and how that functioned to create our emotions and behavior. And I found that my third year rotation in psychiatry was just fascinating because in those days they would put usually teen girls on a, that had clinical depression or anxiety in the hospital for sometimes a few months, a few weeks to a few months. And I read everything I could read about it and I had my own first patients there and discovered that the ratio in clinical depression, female to male, was two to one. And that really knocked my socks off, that two to one ratio. And it's worldwide in all cultures that have ever been looked at, that ratio of two to one of, of clinical depression and anxiety in females over males. My first thought was, well, that's really not very fair. <laughs> and then I realized, looking at the literature, that in childhood, it's only one to one. So boys and girls, it's about even. And it starts to change to the two to one between ages 13 and 15. And so, of course, I knew what happened then. You know, there's massive hormone changes. So I'll talk, you know, so there was something about that that just really captivated me. I went on then to go to do my residency in psychiatry at Harvard, which is just New Haven to Boston. It's just, you know, it's not too far, just up the road, right, George? And um, it, it was there that I learned all the psychiatric diseases. I started working with women in depression. I never circled back around to the hormone part of that until I was on faculty for my first few years at Harvard, and then I came out to UC San Francisco. So I went to UCSF, and there I founded a clinic called the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic. And finally, I got to sort of put together what sort of had been a passion for me forever, and you don't realize until you get the opportunity to do that. And my department just kind of, it, the, the, just, they just left me alone to sort of do what I wanted to do. Um, that's actually where I met my lovely husband, who um, ended up, he was the, he's the director of the uh, Center for Neurobiology and Psychiatry there at UCSF. And of course, so that means we kind of speak the same language, more or less. And in doing the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic, which I founded in 1994, um, I would got to see women with anxieties and depressions and sort of fit it together with the puzzle of where they were hormonally, either a young fertile female with, with cycle problems and you know PMS at the end, or um, postpartum depression. I don't know if Ira's in the audience today, but I spoke with him last night and um, about how you know 
at the very end of pregnancy, sometimes the hormones that drop so quickly within another two or three weeks after giving birth, women can end up with a postpartum depression, which is not good for her or the baby. So I got to specialize in this clinic in all of those things. And after six or seven years doing the clinic, I was recruited and by uh, an editor from Random House to write a book about it, which ended up being five years after that. <laughs> I said, I don't have time to write a book. I don't write a book. She says, don't worry. Just dictate it to me, and I'll write it. <laughs> of course, that never happens. That they, that's, how they, that's how they induce you to come over to what they want you to do. So the female brain book got written after five years, and um, it was really a, a wonderful experience to have written in lay language, something that was um, what I'm going to tell you today about. I'm just going to give you the highlights so that you can kind of take some of the um, special points of this, whether you have the book or read the book. Does anybody, uh, does anybody know someone who's read the book or has the book? OK, so this one in the back, some of the other people I know. I used to have a bunch of guys when it first came out, men in their early 40s, and their 40s would come in and buy a stack of them. And they want me to sign one, dear Dave, dear John, and wait, or dear. And I was wondering, well, I finally asked one guy, what, what, why are all of you guys buying this book? And they said, oh, oh, well, we have, we have daughters that are 13, 14. Isn't that thing called, a father's thing called Indian princesses? Or you, you go camping with your daughters. So they all had to have this book for what's happened to their teenage daughters. At any rate, so I'm just going to go through some of the really juicy, cool stuff that I've learned over the years and um, transmit some of that to you today. And then I want to save a lot of time at the end for you to ask whatever question just pops into your mind um, about this area. So um, let's see. I know that this is being videoed, so I hope that I'm, I'm not frustrating you by walking around up here too much. <laughs> OK. All right. So just starting out with this statement, because I think it's really, really important to start from the fact that you know, our brains, no matter what gender, what race, no matter what, we are more alike than different. After all, we are the same species. So coming from that foundation of being more alike than different, and all of our circuits are, are certainly more alike than different, I want to talk to you about what some of the differences are in the female brain and the male brain. So this is a sperm, and it is piercing the surface of the egg. And if that sperm carries an X, what, what is the baby going to be? So it'll be XX, so it'll be female, right? If that sperm is carrying a Y, it'll end up male. So it all begins, what's your gender? It begins at conception, right there at that moment. And what that means is that here we are cooking away, marinating in all of our hormones, that if it was a Y, if that is a boy, the tiny testicles in about an eight-week-old fetus start to pump out huge amounts of testosterone. And by the middle of gestation, the testosterone levels are about what they are in the adult male. So they are, we're talking about being marinated in a huge amount of testosterone. What is that testosterone doing? It's marinating all the cells and all the brain and all the body and all the parts. So it's changing the body parts and the brain parts into male. If it's an XX, if it's a girl, that fetus is actually hanging out there, cooking away, unperturbed by testosterone. So the circuits don't get changed to male. The body parts don't get changed to male. So that's why you might hear sometimes, you might hear the, say, the phrase that nature's default program is female. Because if not, there's no testosterone in there, that baby's going to develop female. If there's testosterone in there, that baby is going to develop all the male parts. So by the time we're born, we either have a male brain or a female brain. And you know, there's lots of exceptions and various things that we can talk about in the Q&A period. But you basically come out sort of primed with what your sex is going to be, male or female. And I think that's a very interesting time of life, too, because um, you still have lots of hormones. The males still have testosterone levels 
almost up to adult male levels until, they're, until you guys are nine months old. Girls have start to have estrogen levels almost at the adult female levels until they're about two years old. So I'll show you that in a minute. Cause. So I put this up here because when I was at UC Berkeley, you know you hang out in your dorm, you talk to your girlfriends, whatever you talk about how when you have children you're going to do blah, 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 you're not going to do blah, 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 based on whatever. Our, we used to talk about how when we had our boys, we were going to raise them gender neutral. We were going to we were going to give them the toy. We we're going to get them both toys. We were not going to have them. Our future daughters-in-law would thank us for the sensitive husbands we had raised for them. <laughs> how deluded were we? You know, <laughs> we didn't realize how deluded we were. Of course, until we had our own sons. So when my son was born, you know, I still was of the mind that this could be possible. <laughs> so you, you, how many of you guys have sons? And how many have daughters? And how many have both? <laughs> okay, so those of you who have both can, will really appreciate how this goes down. But you can go out of the grocery store, you know, those little action figures and whatever. And this was one of my son's favorite action figures. I mean, it was, it was just nuts that this, he was so attached to this. Like, I remember giving him a doll in, for Christmas one year. He rips open the package pulls her out. It was, it was some kind of a Barbie doll, something with like the leg, whatever. I don't know if it was really a Barbie or not, but it was a tall, long-legged doll, whatever, but it wasn't an action figure. He looks at that. He grabs her by the torso, and he thrusts her legs into the air, like, come on, guys, let's get him. I mean, he used her body as a sword. So <laughs> That's when I gave up, whatever. I figured, OK, they're wired like they're wired. And you've all heard of the phrase rough and tumble play, that boys do that. So about nine out of 10 boys are like much more rough and tumble in terms of what they want to do. Girls will do that a little bit. And then they want to do something that little girls will want to do something else. They like to do what's called uh, relationship and role playing. Uh, at Stanford, a woman named Eleanor Maccabee is like the grand dame, I think now in her mid to late 90s, but she's the grand dame of like studying three and four year old gender differences in behavior in the preschool setting. And she basically, the, the little girls will sit and they'll do a little rough and tumble with the guys or the boys will sit and do one go round of this sort of play like you be the mommy and I'll be the daddy, right? Or you be the doctor, I'll be the patient. So the assignment of roles and playing out is very typical of little girl play versus boys will do that for about one, and then they'll go, OK, guys, come on, let's get them, and they're off and running. So um, this is kind of a typical. And just did any, did any of you, who taught your, children, your boys to do rough and tumble play? Who actually taught them? Any of you guys actually have, have to teach your boys to do this? Any of you have to teach your girls to do this kind of like? I was kind of a, a tom, I was a little bit of a, of a tomboy. I used to like to go lizard hunting and stuff with, with the neighbor boys and their dads. So that was kind of fun too. But I also made clothes for my dolls. So there's, there's this, there's kind of a blurred gender. Some, some girls end up with tomboys. Some girl, boys will end up liking to do some more girl stuff. But this, so these are kind of generalizations. But this rough and tumble play and this relationship stuff for, for little girls is sort of a behavior that's very typical three and four-year-olds, that we don't have to teach them. It just unfolds. So what I'm going to teach you here is like what we know about how hormones kind of like end up through our lifespan. So you can see right here where it says the first trimester, second, and third. That's where all the hormone pulses of the testosterone in the males are cooking and marinating in a lot of hormones. And at birth, you see this section right here, right after birth, with a lot of hormones still up until age one or two, that's called infantile puberty. Has anybody ever heard of infantile puberty? Who's ever heard of that? I had never heard of it until I started doing some research for <laughs> some of the, the books and things and talking to one of my colleagues at UCSF that was a pediatric endocrinologist. Nobody really studies this very much, and, and I, we don't know why. And they don't know why the ovaries and testicles are pumping out so much sex hormone up at this stage of life. They think it's like priming the body and brain to get ready for reproduction, which is, of course, why we as a human species are successful, is because we do reproduce a lot. But you see this big flat area here, right here in the middle, where age one to about 10, 
the, the pediatric endocrinologist called the juvenile pause or the latency period. And we, we lay people call it childhood. <laughs> That's childhood, where females and male children have very low levels of the sex hormones. They're about equivalent ama amounts of estrogen and testosterone in kids through, through up till about age 8, 9, 10. And I think that's kind of an interesting. And why, why, why humans have that childhood, other animals don't. They just go straight into being reproductive. We have childhood, something about how we, what we need to do with our brains in order to be, be ready to um, propagate the species. And then, do you see what happens there at about 10? So 9, 10, 11, 12, the rock and roll starts. <laughs> Look at that hormone surge that happens at that stage. Boy, that's a blast off from puberty. And girls, typically, um, there's a bit of a racial difference in terms of age of onset of menses, which is called menarche. They call it menarche, meaning the start of the period. For Caucasian girls, it's between 11 and 12. African American girls is about 10 and a half to 11 and a half. And in Asian girls, it's a little bit later, like maybe 11 and a half to 13. So they don't know why. They think it might have to do with the amount of body fat because the brain doesn't want to go into making eggs and things until you have enough body fat to sustain a pregnancy. That's kind of how the biology works. Not that, it, I mean, 13 year olds can get pregnant, but it's not something we do anymore. But there you go for the rock and roll. And boys, oh my gosh. Boys start their, does anybody know how we measure puberty in boys? I mean, girls, we have the onset of menses. What is it in boys that we measure? What's that? The, the voice does change. The voice changes. And of course, the penis goes, gets elongated and the testes grow. But also, the first, the first nocturnal emission, the first wet dream is the onset of real puberty for boys, and it's usually about 13.5, 13 and a half years old. So they're a little delayed. Remember the junior high dances, Peter? Remember? <laughs> I don't know if you went to Jefferson or where you went. Did you? Yes. Yeah, so it was pretty bad, right? The girls are like this tall. The boys are like this tall. Everybody's clustering. So there's this two-year lag for boys and girls in terms of when they start into puberty. And actually, the pulses in the brain start for boys and girls, one and a half years before the actual kind of onset of puberty. So girls will start to have what we call little breast buds. You see the breast buds in like maybe eight, nine, ten-year-old girls, that where they, I don't know, they, they sort of want their first trainer bra at that age or whatever. Or they're even if they're athletic, they that means estrogen is coming out of their ovary and marinating their body and their brain. So if girls that are eight, nine, ten, mothers complain about. Any of you remember when they got a little moody? It's a little. <laughs> A little moodiness started at that stage. So it starts pretty early and starts the full rock and roll. And then remember I told you about the depression, clinical depression and anxiety is one to one down here between boys and girls. But by time they're 14 or 15, the girls are up at that two to one ratio of, of clinical depression and anxiety. We still don't entirely understand what that's about. Um, but it, it's something that we know about the cycles, and I'll show you something about that in a minute. So here are two of your compatriots here. Who knows what they're looking at on that computer? All of a sudden, they're interested in girls' body parts. The girls' body parts sort of pop into their brain. They, they you know, every pair of breasts that start to walk around, they look. You know, it's, a, it's stimulating all of that thing that the male brain is supposed to do. It's wired and getting the fuel, the testosterone fuel, to run those brain circuits that were laid down in fetal life. Remember I told you at eight weeks of fetal life after conception, the, the testicles pump out that testosterone? It's growing an area. One of the areas in the brain that's a big difference is an area that's technically called the area for sexual pursuit. And it grows in the male brain to be 2.5 times larger just while, while it's marinating in utero. So, at this stage, that stuff now has its testosterone fuel. And so these boys are interested, starting to be interested in sexual pursuit, which is how they're wired. So there they go on their who knows what illicit thing they've found on the internet there. And here's the flip side of the coin. <laughs> the interest in girls starts to skyrocket in fashion or being attracted. They want to be attractive 
two boys. Now, if you are going to be same-sex attracted or opposite-sex attracted, this is usually when it starts to peak. Is right in early puberty. So whatever you're, so if you're going to be same-sex attracted, it happens during puberty. If you're going to be opposite-sex attracted, it happens um, at the same stage. So these girls are all probably, you know, primping and makeup and the, you know, the fashion, all the things that girls do at this stage is similar to what those boys were doing. Their behavioral program is being turned on to want to be attractive to boys or to whichever sex they're going to be attracted to. So boys between the ages of 9 and 13 have a 25-fold increase in testosterone. I love your smile. <laughs> this young woman here is smiling like, oh, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it. I know, I just, I, when I saw this, I thought, okay, remember Peter? I mean, Peter, we remember this stage, right? Do, you, do, do any of you guys, do any of you guys, when I talk to men, how many of you men remember this stage where you're just, I mean, you're just, you, you almost don't recognize yourself or your thoughts or it's just, you know, and you, you get with the program pretty quickly. But I can remember, I, I had a very close relationship with my son, and so he would, he would, I would be driving him to school when he was about 13 or whatever. And I said, honey, I'm writing this part of my book, because it was when I was writing The Female Brain or whatever. I'm writing this part of my book about, you know, females and males going through puberty and stuff. And I just, I wouldn't ordinarily ask you this question, but, you know, would you just tell me what guys your age, you know, they think when, you know, they see girls come to school with the, you know, the bikini tops on or whatever. And he says, he says, well, mom, you know, First, you know, you just can't take your eyes off of those things. <laughs> and I said, oh, he said, and he says, guys, you know, guys, mom, they, he says, first, when you start thinking about this stuff, mom, you kind of think you're going to be a perv. <laughs> I mean, the stuff I heard, I mean, you know, I thought, holy Toledo, do you guys, I mean, do any of you guys remember this? I mean, it was a very, okay, but we, we girls don't, we, don't, we didn't know this, so I learned this from my own son about how this, the thought process and the behavior, and, and then pretty soon you talk, start talking. He says, but then you start talking to all the other guys, mom, and you know, then, then, then pretty soon you realize that, that everybody's like that. So guys my age would just say blah, blah, blah. So he says with his voice kind of cracking and going <laughs> into that stage. So you can learn a lot from your kids. Here's what happens with us girls between age like 7, 13, and adult. Our estrogen goes up about 15-fold, so our ovaries are pouring out huge amounts of estrogen, and we actually make testosterone as well. We're gonna, we make testosterone, and that gives girls sex drive. The highest sex drive in girls in their life will be at age 19. Highest testosterone in boys is about between 18 and 25. And I'll show you what happens over the male lifetime, too. You guys don't lose too much of it. <laughs> okay, and another, this really interesting study Teen girls feel the pain of a loved one, so they've done all these cool brain studies. And this one right here where all the red is on where it says pain, they have a person's partner laying and getting these small little shocks to their fingers or whatever, and the brain is registering pain in that area. And then they've got the female partner, not in the brain scanner, but she's hooked up to measure, to, they have her in the separate brain scanner right next door, letting her brain light up, but she doesn't get the shocks. But she's hearing her partner get shocks. You know, he's supposed to be moaning and groaning and exaggerating a little bit, whatever. So, her brain is not getting any pain, but there she's got that empathy center in some of the same pain areas lighting up. And also, girls in this stage of life can cry four times more more easily than males do. So, I just found that that behaviorally is is really interesting. Um, and this is the second one I will just show you that I found fascinating. This is basically about the reaction to faces. The first one here where the blue is, they just gave them sugar pills. And the red is where they gave them testosterone. And the first one, if they're showing happy faces in the brain scanner and looking at the heart rate and watching what got turned on. You know, the happy faces with the placebo and the testosterone are about the same. But when you showed angry faces, Look at that big bump there in terms of just the, your physiological body's heart rate and everything reacts to angry faces with testosterone so much more. But can you imagine how cool this study was to read for someone like me who 
was so interested in how hormones actually push you into a behavior, push you into a way of seeing the world, push you into a way of seeing faces, you know. Um, so we have so much circuitry in our brain that's related in humans to watching faces. We can look, that's one thing that, you know, about doing Botox and all this stuff. If you paralyze your faces, a mother's face, you paralyze to her child, the child gets very upset because there's not this mirroring of the little tiny micro expressions in the face. So anyway, testosterone will give you a real reaction to angry faces. Uh, that's both male and female will we'll get this. But of course, there's those poor male guys. I mean, poor, you poor guys, <laughs> 13 to 15, you see someone looking at you with an angry face, you're, you know, you may be just, do you remember that feeling? You're just like, you're ready to stand him down, you know? <laughs> okay, here's another aspect that's different of the male and female brain starting. Anybody remember the teens, maybe a little bit, at that stage where you couldn't get them to go to bed, you couldn't get them up in the morning. I mean, the, that it's called the chronobiology of like the time they want to fall to sleep goes on and on and on, and you're you're ready to hit hit the hay like two hours, three hours before they are. So the sleep difference, though, in the male female sleep pattern starts at puberty. The red one is female, and the blue is male. Male teens go to bed even later their chronobiology later than the females and wake up later. So I feel it's torture for coaches to ask boys to be on the field at seven in the morning to play sports. I mean, they really just have a bunch of zombies out there on that field, right? Um, and it doesn't return to being kind of a one-to-one -one ratio until menopause, until, until we all get to about age 50. So there's a, a slight shifting in our chronobiology in the time we fall asleep and the time we wake up between male and female sleep patterns. It, we don't usually, most of us, I don't know, I, I don't notice this, but this is just what the data says, and it's a bit different in the girls. So let's just take a little view and, of the hormones in the female brain. We have the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So I just want to show you kind of the cool bottom line about what's going on from puberty up till, you know, up till we hit the, up to the menopause. Here is just the basic standard textbook menstrual cycle. And we, this color that's menses, the dark black is where actually the, the menses is happening, which is from day, we, we measure it from day one. So day one, two, three, four, five are the days of, of bleeding of menses. So the first week, we call it, the first week is basically the menstrual period. And you see what's happening right here is that estrogen level is going way up there because the ovary is pumping out all this estrogen, and it triggers the brain, the pituitary, to release the hormone that makes you ovulate. And when you're way, when it's way up there, actually, females have been been shown behaviorally to be more flirtatious, put on a little sexier clothes, a little bit more maybe lipstick or makeup. It's a very interesting behavioral change. It's also their most loquacious. They're very chatty much more verbal. So I tell, always tell my female graduate students they should schedule their oral exams <laughs> on day 12 of their menstrual cycle. <laughs> uh, and you can see that testosterone is the black hill, actually, this little dotted black nice hill right in the middle. But you see testosterone is at its highest in females right before ovulation. I say that's, that's, that's how God she made it that you got pregnant, right? He wanted to have sex, increased your libido right before ovulation. So that's, that's the plan. And you don't get any of that red hill of progesterone until after ovulation. And progesterone is so cool because it is the one that we study because it's what gives you da, 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 <laughs> that couple of days. You see how that big progesterone hill starts to dive down and start, when it dives down, progesterone acts in the receptors in the brain where Valium works, the same receptors. So you feel kind of mellow and sort of laid back maybe when it's high, like on the third week of the cycle, day 21, day 22. Then all of a sudden when it starts to crash, it's like your brain is in Valium withdrawal. You're irritable could bite somebody's head off because they looked at you cross-eyed or you think they said that you looked fat or whatever it is, you know, that, that's got you going. 
And that happens in 80% of women at some point. We all remember that, it's, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science, and it doesn't ruin your life, it, but it can mess up some issues of your relationship uh, at that stage. So we, you know, I used to have the couples, the cup, there's some women, about 8% of women have it badly, and they have it for like a week or two. It's just pretty bad. I had them in my office with their significant other, and I give the guy a three by five card, and he's to write down what he, the do's and don'ts, right? <laughs> and I tell him to put it in his drawer, and when it gets to be that time, the do's and don'ts. You do not say, honey, is it that time of the month? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and you basically just say, you know, can I do anything to help? That's their only line. Can I do anything to help? And if there's an argument that happens because you're disagreeing on something, don't just sweep it under the rug. You write it down on that card and you put it in the drawer and wait for two days until you're both at your best. <laughs> And then you work it through, right? You don't sort of try to argue when somebody's not at their best. So uh, that's, the, that's the stage of, I, I treated a lot of, of PMS in my, my clinic in the days. Here is the other huge change in females during pregnancy. Look at that progesterone peak there. I mean, you're going from like about a level of 30 to 150,000. I mean, you're just skyrocketing. Do any of you remember like being eight, nine, ten weeks pregnant? That's, I mean, we always remember the feeling nauseated and being like morning sick all the time. But do any of you remember feeling how sleepy and tired you were? I mean, it's like all of a sudden it was just like I can remember I was at my mother-in-law's and I, I mean, I was like a slug on the couch and I, you know, I did, I could hardly drag myself to help her with the dishes. I felt like the worst daughter-in-law in the world. Yeah, you know, I just was not was not making. Did, did any of you see the Wizard of Oz? Remember when they're walking through the poppy fields and they're getting sleepier? <laughs> Sleepier, sleepier. <laughs> Progesterone is used in anesthesia as a sedative. So it is a really fabulous sedative. It does make you really sleepy. And at those levels, it makes you very calm and sleepy and also makes you hungry, makes you eat more, which is what you want in pregnancy. And it's called the word progesterone. Progestation means for pregnancy. So it is the hormone that you need to keep the pregnancy, keep that little thing implanted for a couple of weeks and then basically help the fetus grow. It keeps basically the uterus from expelling the fetus. So progesterone is like the hormone of pregnancy. But then look what happens at the very end. Boom. It's like the like pulling a tablecloth, a rug out from underneath the chair. The, the whole brain, the brain is being marinated in all this progesterone. All of a sudden, it's gone. And um, the brains of most women, all of a sudden, this progesterone has put your whole brain on pause. The pituitary is not doing its cycle anymore. In the days before birth control, women used to have 18, 19 pregnancies. You know, we, we never had really menstrual cycles because we were always pregnant or always at some stage of this. But, you know, at the very end there, when the progesterone goes away very quickly, there's a percentage of women who get, like, very depressed, very unable to really think what they're supposed to be doing. They don't sleep. They get more and more agitated. And so my clinic was specializing also in treating postpartum depression. It's amazing to me that the pituitary within most women, within three weeks just kind of kicks right back in and it, it starts going. And if you're breastfeeding, of course, you, you don't ovulate for sometimes as long as you're breastfeeding. But there you go. That, that will cause the postpartum depression. So we try to get women, women that have had one postpartum, does anyone know anybody who's had one, a postpartum depression? It's, 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 it's frightening and it's really devastating to families and babies. So I believe that anything people can do to help women out at that stage. So we would very quickly, a woman who's had one postpartum depression has a 50% chance the next pregnancy of having one. So it's not 100%, but it's 50%. And we try to quickly get them and prevent it the next go round. So there are things that you can do. So that's the female brain that's got. <laughs> I, I sort of appreciate this little slide, which George, George will look at this and he'll kind of give it a little smile because I'm sure some of you have probably seen this one before. Um, and you can just, you know, it's, it's probably all over the internet, but I just, I thought it just sort of, 
it's a man's view. It's a man's view of the female brain, right? Right, ladies? <laughs> guys, how many of you guys, just as admit it, kind of, this is sort of your version of like, <laughs> how you're approaching, it should it be a black box though, right? It should be a black box and there it is with all the dials and things. But you can see because of all the changes in the hormones and behavior, every day of your menstrual cycle, you have a different cocktail of hormones. So I kind of think it's amazing that you have any continuity at all, right? I mean, it's just pretty, it's pretty cool. Just thank you guys. Now that you know all these hormones, don't you think we're pretty amazing that we can, we can, we can actually have, see it right? But, but actually, so the scientists believe that the reason of these fluctuations in mood and behavior and things that the females have, it's constantly priming our systems to be very aware of facial, of emotional changes in the people around us, but particularly because Human beings have babies. Our pel we have to stand upright. Our pelvis is pretty small to deliver a baby that's very big. And those babies are helpless for the, really the first year or two of their lives. So we have helpless infants, nonverbal helpless infants. You have to be able as a woman, our, main, our most successful great, great, great grandmothers were really good at keeping helpless infants alive, right? That's why we're all here. They had to do that one thing, which is keep helpless infants a lot. And you have to be able to read what the infant needs. Are they hungry? Are they this? Are they that? So this is the scientist's hypothesis about why the female brain may constantly be primed to be emotionally responsive and reactive to faces and to helpless infants. So there we have it. However, we can't let you guys off completely. Do you, have any of you um, ever sort of had this experience with your daddy brain? Your testosterone actually dropped 30% during the pregnancy, and your prolactin level increases by 35%. Now, the word, the hormone prolactin means for lactation. Women have a huge amount of it. That's what makes our breast milk, right? The breast milk, we need prolactin. We don't still know why these guys, I mean, you guys aren't going to lactate. You're not going to breastfeed, but your prolactin level goes up. It's, con it's now kind of thought that this prolactin is part of a parenting hormone. It's, it's sort of priming your whole system to do caretaking because it, a, a female in the nest alone taking care of a helpless infant, there needs to be somebody to take care of her and take care of the, the, the mother-child bond and take care of the baby. So that happens for about the first six months to two years after, and we think oh, for the daddy brain, dads all of a sudden, they're, da they're males that have never had children, they put them in the brain scanner, and then males who have had children and put them in the brain scanner, and then they, t they tape into your ears, babies crying. And the area in your brain that lights up if you're just a guy who's never had a baby versus those guys who are dads, the dads light up like 10 times more in the baby crying area so your guys' brains do have changed by being a parent, by being a parent as well. And we think that it starts to change because of the pheromones from, the preg from your pregnant partner that waft over into your nostrils during pregnancy. And they kind of go in and change the brain to make less testosterone, more prolactin. You're not interested in chasing skirts while, you know, the it's like keeping you close to home. So yeah, the daddy brain does happen. And this is what you end up with. Look at you guys. This is, the <laughs> this is the new fatherhood, right? The new fatherhood. And that's what your behavioral outcome of the daddy brain is, which I love. Um, OK, so let's, just to review for the female reproductive system, here we are. Menarche is that age when you start menses, and you go through till about 45 to 50 with your reproductive hormone cycle, your menstrual cycle. Then the perimenopause things, we call it the sputtering ovary time. Anybody know that one? I remember that one. Anybody remember that? You're just, everything is wacko. And actually, sometimes your hormones are three or four or five times more than they were. And sometimes they're three or four times less. It's just like up and down over the map. And I mostly, I became a specialist in the perimenopausal depression, moods, anxiety, because there's lots of women just, and sleep problems. It's a real tough time that some women go through. 80% of women go through it 
sort of okay. 20% have a rough time. Then menopause hits, and what happens to estrogen, progesterone? All that menstrual cycle just goes boom. The ovaries have retired. <laughs> Average age 51, ovaries have retired. So then we have another 50 years of retired ovaries. So we've gone back to the same level that we had in childhood of estrogen and testosterone, which is a fairly low level if you don't take replacement. Now, I want to contrast this with the life cycle of you guys. So here you guys are, you know, with all that testosterone surge while you're cooking and marinating in testosterone from your testicles inside when you're being uh, formed. And then you have that infantile puberty surge of testosterone. You have your childhood with nothing. And then you go up at puberty. And you guys do start something that we kind of call andropause, but you can see that nothing falls off the cliff. The testicles don't stop making testosterone. I mean, you're still making plenty by age 100. So, I mean, I mean, guys do notice a difference. I mean, you're not chasing skirts every minute like you were when you were 21 years old. And you just, this, right? We got, all you guys admit to that, right? Some of you, all right. Um, I mean, it's still, a, it's still a fantasy you can conjure up, <laughs> but you're, you may not behave behaviorally out there with that. And so andropause in males do, does happen. You use about, they average at 1% to 2% of your testosterone per year after age 30 goes down. So most guys don't, and you know, any of you guys ever heard that all that pharmacy, pharmaceutical countries adver advertising you the low T, take T, whatever. So there's a whole movement to give men testosterone later, and some like it, some don't. Um, so there we go, guys. That, that is your uh, trajectory through, through the lifespan. And just when we thought we were done, voila, we become grandparents and start the whole system all over again and get to watch it from a, a place of wisdom <laughs> and less responsibility for keeping the helpless infant alive except for maybe some cash flow. <laughs> and of course, lots of love. And any of you heard Leslie Stahl speak recently about the Grandmother Brain book, the book that she's just, just done. So at any rate, that's a, it's a lovely book if you haven't gotten to read it about becoming, it's called Becoming Grandma, which is a lovely, it has a whole chapter also on grandfathers as well. So with that, I will stop, and I thank you for your attention, and we'll answer any questions. Thanks so much. So George, do you have a system by which you like to have questions? Well, we'll just invite, but I want to ask a question. You want the first question? Well, That's it's good. the privilege of the chair. That's good. It's what, I've worked, it's what I've labored 40 years for. Um, in terms of the study, how long and how many uh, people were involved in the study that you did? Uh, which study is that? All of them? No, okay. right. So, you know, the studies with the gender differences, and these aren't my, I was showing you other people's studies, but some of these studies of gender differences end up, you, you don't do them with 10,000 people or even 1,000 people, which are what you need for this really robust statistical power for, for looking at something. Sometimes they're done because, you know, Think about how much it costs per patient to do a brain scan study and do the, do the MRI machines and all that. So these studies are usually fairly small with, with select a group. And you know, guess, guess what the ages in, Ameri in American studies, the ages of the participants in these studies tend to be in their mid to early 20s because they're undergraduates. They're undergraduates and they don't, we don't need to pay them very much. They're sort of happy. They're kind of, it's usually their professor who's doing the study. So, I mean, there's a little conflict of, you know, but at any rate, they, their students are doing. And in Europe, actually, there are people more in their 30s and 40s. So you have to, when you're reading these studies, you have to kind of look. And the reason is, in Europe, they have many um, freestanding kind of uh, inst research institutes. And um, participants, I don't know whether they get paid for doing it or not, but at any rate. They're not very large when they're doing the MRI phase. So you must remember also that something that's called a gender difference, if you look at the bell-shaped curve of male and female, in some things they're overlapping, they're identical. There's no difference at all. And if you look at most studies, there might be like 
in the 10 to 20 percent difference in something that's really well known to be robustly different. So we know that IQ is not different. We know that, you know, we know that there's all kinds of things that aren't different between males and female brains. But when it comes to sort of things that are stimulated by hormones, the sex hormones, those are the areas that we end up finding, you know, more behavioral differences. So thanks for that question. That's a very important one. Um, in the back, yes? And she'll repeat the question. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question, which is about, like, is the corpus callosum, which is this, you know, that if you've seen the brain, right, it's got this big hemisphere on the left, the big hemisphere on the right, and then this big, big, like, white thing down the middle that connects the two called the corpus callosum. And they used to think, there were small studies done that used to show, people up in Toronto and Canada did a bunch of these studies, and found that there was a certain area in the female corpus callosum that seemed to be larger than in the male, which connected the two hemispheres. And so a lot was made of that back in the 80s and 90s in the early studies. They have now redone all of those with fancier equipment with the new generation T7 you know, MRI machines and found that actually the statistical difference went away. So I've become very, you know, as you, when, as you get older in your field, you become chastened by things that you used to think were correct and that you now don't. And then you can spin these stories out about like, oh, and this is why women multitask. They've actually found multitasking. How many of you feel like you're really terrific at multitasking? <laughs> oh, gosh, please come run my household. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so they found that, you know, that you can hold at most two things in mind at once, one in the left and one in the right hemisphere. And there's kind of one waiting in the wings. But as soon as you pick up that third thing, you have to drop one of the others. So just how a really good fast brain works is it may quickly drop one thing and pick up the other. And those people have some maybe faster circuits. And I find that as I've gotten older, I do well to just like, please, I want to hold just one thing in mind at once so I can get that task done. And my lovely husband has been a model for me in that. He is the type of person who something comes to him, he touches that thing once, makes a decision and gets it done, and then he doesn't have to think about it anymore. So I think that that's, that after age 60, that's what we should all do. But the, thank you for that question because it's a really, it's really a specific representation of how you can think and make up a story about something that you think is real, and then poof, you know, 10 years later, new technology, and it's not... It's not accurate. Well, the thing we know that's robust and true is that you've got different circuits that God laid down, and the hormone field that runs them starts at puberty, and you've got this menstrual cycle. You've got that stuff that's happening with the sex hormones, and that that, that stuff we know is really continues, obviously, to, to be different. So thanks for that question. And I know that this gentleman right here in the blue sweater had a question. The first uh, rhetorical question is, what took you so long to write this? Did you hear what he said? He says, what took you so long to write this thing? It could have kept me out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> that question, though, involves uh, were there studies that were done with transgender people and were their, their brains aligned more with their self-identified gender or with their biological gender and what maybe some of the implications of that are? So the question is about the transgender brain and is there something that's been looked at for whether their hormones or behavior go along with their identified um, sex or not, or how, how that works out. Um, that research is yet to come. So if there's any young people in this room who are really like burning to really make a name for themselves and do some interesting work, it's to be yet to be done. Because, first of all, you don't have, you have to get enough numbers to look at the difference. You gotta get the female to male, or the male to female, and you have, there is a hospital in Denmark that for 35 years has been a specialty hospital uh, for transgender people going through. And I, in ninth, there's a really great paper that was written in 1994 when I started the Women's Mutant Hormone Clinic that really got me going in that because they would, they, you have to, in their system, two years you have to wait from the time you kind of announce that you'd like to transition to the time that you can actually start the surgical transition. So, 
they started people out and they measured all kinds of things like how fast they did math, how they did the mental rotation test, how verbal they were, how they did all these great studies that they thought showed a gender difference. And then they started to give them the hormone of the gender they wanted to become. So the males started getting estrogen and testosterone blocking medicine. The females started getting testosterone. They looked two years later and they found that the females that had gotten testosterone became scoring worse on their verbal scores, <laughs> but much higher on their libido, on their sexual interest scores off the charts. And the males who had started getting the testosterone reduced and giving them estrogen, they got better on the verbal scores and their libido was in the toilet. <laughs> so I loved that. And that was even way back you know, before a lot of technology. So what about the brain? How does this happen? I mean, as we know that there's, there's some syndromes that we know genetic, a genetic disorder that's called uh, testicular femin feminization syndrome, where you don't form the receptors for testosterone. So you're, you're, that sperm was carrying a Y, and so the baby is XY, male, but you don't have any of these receptors that recognize testosterone. So all that testosterone from the testicles is being made during the fetal, but there's no receptors to recognize the testosterone. So actually, the baby comes out with female genitals, Female brain, whatever, everything is female. They're, even though they have testicles that tend to be internal testicles. So a lot of times, these people don't even know their X, Y. I remember one of my first endocrinology patients in medical school, Yale Medical School, was a very good looking tall guy, you know, like 6'3", came in with his girlfriend for a workup for infertility. And, um, you know, the genetic difference was found at that point, that there was a Y rather than an X. And they, so they have to go looking at the testicles that are internal because they have a higher ratio of cancer. So you can look at different, different uh, genetic differences and try and figure out, but that's as close as we've gotten. The other study that was done in Sweden of, of same-sex attracted males, they put same-sex attracted males and opposite sex, so heterosexual guys and gay guys in the brain scanner. They had a, um, a pheromone, pheromones from females wafting into the brain scanner and, get, and then scanned their brains. And the guys that were hetero guys, their brain lit up in all the interest and sexual interest areas. But in the gay guys, it ended up in the insula region lighting up in an area that was for disgust. And they wafted in male pheromones to both of this group. And the gay guys had a big boost in their area for sexual interest with male pheromones, whereas the hetero guys, it ended up in the disgust center. Now, that study has not been repeated. It's, you know, it's like you take it with a grain of salt. But there's something just, there is something biologically different. So it's not something that all of a sudden is a moral decision you make in your teens that you're going to be, you know, same-sex attracted to the opposite sex attracted. I mean, it's something you're born, you, you know, it, it starts with something to do with your genes and your hormones, et cetera. It's not to say that environment doesn't have anything. And the transgender kids, you know, sometimes know by the time they're six or seven, they want to dress in their, their, their identities. They want to dress in the clothing of the gender they feel they are. And you, some of you have seen those, the 60 minute program on the transgender kids, even the, the twin iGen. Like, and you know, so we don't know what's going on there, but what pediatricians now do is they keep them from going into puberty. So that if they're going to be, if they're female, and they, want, they feel male, you don't want them to develop breasts and everything, you don't want that to go because they have to have surgery. So there's a whole protocol now for how you deal with transgender kids. It's quite, quite fascinating, and there's a lot of controversy about not wanting to let them have the surgery until they're 18, until they can make their own decisions. Anyway, I hope that was probably more than you wanted to know, but. Uh, Dr. Get prostate cancer and they get AIDS, 
course, there were different times in which fibroblast implants were alive, but what information is available regarding what happens when you change the hormone balance that radically in, in, in multiple ACs? Let me, so the question is, if I can rephrase just, it, yeah. It's Dr. Jerry Braun and Sue Braun. He's one of the world's great hand surgeons. She was on our school board. Okay, Dr. Braun, nice to meet you. <laughs> but it's a fab. But, no, but it's a really interesting question, and I have a, an interesting story about that. But remember, this this hospital in Denmark is giving those men Lupron, which is the anti-testosterone drug they give if you have prostate cancer, right? It suppresses your testosterone, just completely wipes it out. And though they have looked at that in that group, of course, that's the transgender group. In heterosexual males who have prostate cancer and are given Lupron, which is an, a drug that basically stops your pituitary, just like puts pituitary at rest so you don't have any more hormone cycles. As a male, you don't make any more testosterone so that you don't activate your prostate cancer anymore. The Lupron males um, have um, basically, they get, they get more clinical depressions. <laughs> they get hot flashes up the wazoo. They feel like pretty, they feel miserable. They have, their libido is in the toilet. And um, interestingly enough, I, so, and he, this, the person I'm going to tell you about has written about this in Forbes and whatever. So I was a friend with Andy Grow, and um, he was uh, CEO of Intel for a long time. Some of you may remember um, Andy, but he was, had prostate cancer, and he was out about his whole story. It was all over the press at the time, and he was very much, um, an, a very big help in pushing that field forward, he was on Lupron and his secretary noticed that it was, she didn't know about it at the time, but she said he would come in and, you know, he usually is like, you know, very, he, Andy is, he wrote only the, he wrote the book called Only the Paranoid Survive. I mean, this is, this is like full blown testosterone guy. And when he was on the Lupron, he would come in, he said, his secretary said, he'd come in, he'd kind of sit down on her desk and say, you know, well, you know, how are your kids doing? <laughs> and it, she said it was just like a remarkable change in kind of his uh, social interest. He was not quite the driven. So you, the, that's just an anecdote. Of course, that means nothing in terms of real biology, but it's a great question. We, and also in breast cancer, they put women on tamoxifen. They completely take your ovaries out and you go into acute menopause, uh, which, you know, can cause hot flashes. You get, you get brain freeze. Your, your, your mood is you know, can definitely be in the toilet. It's, you know, you really end up with the, being any of these treatments. And of course you get the chemo brain. I mean, you have so many things on top of each other, so it's hard to tease it out when you have a, a cancer or something. But I think that's a great, great question. And actually one of our most important options for treating hot flashes in women actually came from a study in men with prostate cancer. They wanted to try and stop hot flashes with a drug called Paxil. Anybody ever hear of Paxil? It's an antidepressant, but they started using it in these guys on Lupron to treat their mood, not to treat their, <laughs> and they discovered the only thing it really was effective for is it stopped these guys' hot flashes. So that's how it started being used, Effexor and Paxil and Prozac, and women for menopause, hot flashes, who, those women who couldn't take the hormones. So, that's, maybe, that's a long-winded story. Now you know everything I know about that area. I hope that was at least of some interest. <laughs> I, I, just a cultural question, and we'll go here. Um, up the wazoo, that was the expression you used. So is that Oceanside High, Yale, or Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, probably Oceanside. <laughs> probably the beach culture. <laughs> right, Peter, don't you yeah, think? Sure. Right? That was, was that a phrase in our teen years? Yeah, I remember that <laughs> Yes. So you have two psychiatrists here, and I'm curious uh, to hear in your clinic if you, when you get a patient, a woman with uh, on perimenopause, from symptoms of depression or anxiety, do you recommend the hormone replacement or both the SSRI or anything else? So she says there are three psychiatrists up here in the front row. Hello, fellow comrades. <laughs> um, and what happens if you get a perimenopausal woman, so that's that age usually between 42 and 52 years old, she's depressed, comes into your clinic. Do you treat them with antidepressants? Do you treat them with hormones? What do you treat them with? Or both. Or both. So um, usually in my clinic, because to call up and get an appointment, you have to, have, you have to say to the person on the other end, 
you know, I want to go to the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic because I have some stuff going on with my hormones and I'm depressed. So they self-select already. So I, I give you that as just kind of a proviso. And so they're willing to do whatever, whatever we would suggest to make them feel better because it's a fascinating area of depression, clinical depression studies that in the perimenopause, women have a 13 time more chance of having the first clinical depression they've ever had in their life, even if they've never been depressed in their life. And we don't understand why, but we, we know that sometimes women in this stage of life just end up feeling miserable. And I've had women who have, they have great lives. They have great kids, husbands. They're socioeconomically, you know, in the 1% and whatever. And they're in my office saying, Dr. Brizendine, you know, if I didn't have kids, I didn't have this whatever, I'd feel so bad. I, if I knew I had to feel like this the rest of my life, I would choose to not go on. So it's, it's a profound statement that this really, that that is how they feel in the perimenopause. So what we do is we start with, with whatever. I never, you never start with two things at once. So we figure out where they are in the perimenopause. They're getting hot flashes. They're not sleeping. They have, an, they have a period that's every two weeks or short or intermittent or something has changed with their cycle. Usually it's getting shorter. Every three weeks they're having their period is the hallmark for that. So we know that if we give them an antidepressant that's in the SSRI category, like Prozac category of drugs, which is there eight, nine, ten of those now, that um, that usually will help in the range of 70 to 80 percent of them will do fine and that will stabilize them for the couple of years until they can kind of go through the perimenopause and come out the other end. So that's, that's our go-to number one. However, we get these, my clinic gets the, we get, we get the rare birds, we get the people who've already seen four doctors before, they've already seen two psychiatrists and four other doctors before they get into our clinic. And so often they're already on the antidepressants. And so if you add a bit of estrogen to them at this time, as long as they don't have a personal history of breast cancer or not a genetic history, you know, we, we rule them out for everything. We get sign-offs from their OBGYN that they can take. We give them estrogen along with their antidepressant, and we found that it gives it a boost to, you know, but the boost is, the boost may be only in the 20%, 30% range, but for these women, that makes a difference. They sleep better, they, they feel a little, they just mentally feel a little sharper. So. We do use both because they've already come to us on a slew of things with a lot of doctors. So I hope, is that what you? Yes. Okay. There's some great papers written by Peter Schmidt and David Rubinow from the National Institutes of Mental Health that have studied this area for 25 or 30 years. So it's, uh, it, there's some stuff in the literature about it that's helpful, but that's the bottom line. We, okay. We have time for two more. In the All right. Back. Yes. <coughs> So the, so the question is about postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. They are thought to be different illnesses. Um, there's overlap. But the way we distinguish them is a woman, and this is really important because a postpartum psychosis is a medical emergency because those are the women that end up either killing themselves or killing their children. They're, that's rare, but that is the category, is postpartum psychosis. The way we can distinguish it is it comes on within two to three weeks after giving birth, whereas the postpartum depression usually doesn't sort of start up until three, four, five weeks after giving birth. So it's a little earlier for the psychosis. They start having strange ideas about, once if you, if you can get them to talk to you about it, they, they have ideas like, this world is just too evil to have a child alive in, and I'm going to take my child with me and you know drive off the cliff or something. So you start, infanticide is something that you worry about as the thing you're trying to prevent in that group of women. Um, so we hospitalize those women. In, your, in our country, we don't have the facilities except at one place to hospitalize the mother and the baby together because we don't want to break the bond between the mother and baby, but they need 24-hour supervision from medical care. So there's always somebody with them. In England, they have the mothers and the babies admitted together. 
and they're under 24-hour you know, medical supervision. In this country, unfortunately, we just put the mom in the hospital for safety, and the baby can come visit. So at any rate, I hope, does that answer your question about that? Thank you. So, Uh, it's considered to be a 50% risk. Not 100% risk, but 50%. But if it's a postpartum psychosis, we sort of, we just get, we treat, we treat those, those women for the next pregnancy to prevent the postpartum psychosis, and we have her under high observation. So we don't, we don't, we don't just let her go without meds. Some women will insist they do, but we really keep a close eye on them. So thank you for that question. Um, look, so that you're going to get the last question. I, I want to ask a question following. but. She, she, she will be around for a little bit, so we can, she, I, I know she will be happy, but go ahead with your question. Um, this is an area that really interests me, and it's a little topic, but I'm curious, is there any relationship between nutrition and the endocrinological system and how the brain develops or how the hormonal cycles are affected by that? So the question is, is there any relationship between nutritional uh, aspects and the hormonal aspects of all of this in terms of the brain development, of course, behavior, behavior and all, you know, so um, this is an area that's really fascinating and, and really very, very important. The thing you need to realize, as long as you have all of the basic nutritional elements that you need to be healthy, and that's a big if, right? Because if you're, if you're in, you know, the lower social economic groups in our country, you basically have a chance of being at least vitamin D deficient and deficient in 10 other, you know, horribly. And folic acid is something always given during pregnancy so that you can prevent spina bifida. I mean, there's really a dearth, it's a really an important area where you need the pregnant mom to be able to have a great nutritionist working with her, especially in impoverished areas. But can you do something about the actual hormones and keeping these people that have any of these fluctuations more stable is to have, make sure someone's getting six and a half hours of good sleep every night and getting really good nutrition can help people that actually have these hormone fluctuations be stabilized. So that is something that really should be done first and foremost. So thank you all so much. It's a delight to get to talk with you, but I know George is gonna have a no, it's, final. It's, it's, you did the bell at dinner, <coughs> dinner last night. You did the bell curve, as I remember, in reference to Donald Trump. Do you want to share that? <laughs> you mean where he is? <laughs> so you know, so you know, we so in the human population, we know um, that there's about four percent of the population that are sociopaths, um, and. We know that there is a large percentage, you know, in, that in, in that five, six percent that are, are truly deep narcissists, right? And so they can't, they have a hard time um, putting themselves in anybody else's shoes. I mean, they, they really just have, you know how you think about autism and Asperger's where you, where you can't really read the emotions on somebody else's face. I mean, narcissism is a dis disorder, and I don't know that he, I, don't, I never evaluated him clinically. Um, I'm only, you know, I'm only reading what you all are reading, but um, that um, where he is on that bell-shaped curve is what, where a way off to, to one side in, in terms of narcissism. Clearly, um, it's not that we haven't had other presidents who have a big dose of narcissism too. I mean, it takes a lot. Think about what it would be like to run for president. I mean, it's a, you know, you had to have a pretty sturdy ego to take take the criticism that you get. But that's what Charlie Fiorino said to me. So. Yes. Yeah, so, so you had she had, yeah, she's got a good ego too, I guess. But um, so I don't know. This is the, this, you know. I, I really I really believe that this, you know, the personal is political and the political is personal. It's everything. I mean, my motivation for doing what I've done in my life at different stages comes from something that I'm personally struggling with or dealing with. And I think we all have to put ourselves, you know, out there now for something that's political because our our country is at stake right now. We we have a really tough we have a really tough go of it at the moment. Um, no matter, it's just, it's a really complicated time and we have, you know, all kinds of minds, all kinds of people, all kinds of socioeconomic groups need the chance to have the best nutrition, right? To have um, moms that get the good treatment if they have postpartum depression, psychosis, if they have perimenopausal depression, if they have any of these things, we need to have um, the next generation 
be as healthy as possible, and we've got to have healthy parents, and we have to have, you know, a system that, that supports people better than we're doing right now with all the holes in the, in the system that we have. So all I have to say to our country and to all of us at this point is this year, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I will deal with UPS on the books, but if you're going to buy the book, and I encourage you to buy it, go to Barnes & Noble, and the reason is Barnes & Noble is actually a bookstore. Thank you, and thank you. Yes. Thank you.